what we hope will be a series of lectures on the development of state. I'd like to begin by inviting and welcoming to the days Professor Chetan Singh, who's going to be chairing the session. Our guest speaker, <coughs> Professor Boaventura Sos Santos. Uh, and our discussants, Professor Shen Mayara and Professor Gopal Guru. I want to welcome all of you here today. And what I said was going to, I hope, will be a series of lectures of the development of state. We have invited Professor Boa as the first speaker of the series because he's actually known to those of us who have been engaging with the World Social Forum as one of the seminal thinkers who sees that location as the location of his philosophical work. He has used that location to contest major ideas and streams of thought, both conceptual and policy related. <coughs> in fact, in his work, which has come to be regarded as an important intervention, not just an important intervention, but an intervention which has defined the field in the epistemology of the South, he has challenged concepts such as the public sphere and has, in this process, forwarded an alternative conceptual frame to look at uh, issues between the North and the South. Uh, I'm, I'm delighted to welcome him here uh, because he has, at the moment, been, been, been leading a very large project, Alice, Strange Mirrors, Unsuspected Lessons, leading Europe to a new way of thinking of sharing world experiences. This is a very prestigious project which has been awarded uh, by the European Union and is in a sense a way of engaging with creative thought uh, in the Global South. So, so India is one of the areas that is part of this large comparative project. Professor Boaventura Sosa Santos is Professor of Sociology at the School of Economics, University of Coimbra, Portugal. He's a distinguished legal scholar at the University of Wisconsin-Madison at the law school and a global legal scholar at the University of Warwick. He has received several awards, most recently the Science and Technology Prize of Mexico and the Kaplan Junior Prize of the Law and Society Association 2011. Professor Boa has published uh, widely on globalization, on sociology of law and the state, on epistemology, on democracy, on human rights in many languages. Um, among his many books are The Rise of the Global Left, Law and Globalization from Below Towards a Cosmopolitan Legality, and his most recent work, The Flower of Witches, Available to the Outside, on Epistemologies of the South, Justice Against Epistemicide. We are delighted to invite you here, sir, Professor, because we want very much in India, in our public debate, to engage with the issues that you have raised and which, in a sense, have become part of the public discourse uh, in, in, in the Latin world. So we are delighted that many of those ideas and many of those arguments that you have been engaging with will hopefully be available to us here in India. I'm also delighted to welcome Professor Chetan Singh, the director of the Indian Institute of Advanced Study, a scholar historian who has, uh, in his work, worked on um, not just uh, issues of, of law and, and environment, but most recently has been doing extensive work on the Himalayas. Uh, Professor Chetan Singh has just, uh, in, in August of last year, uh, taken over as the director of the Institute of Advanced Study. And the Institute of Advanced Study is one of the partner institutes of the uh, International Center for Human Development. I'm also invited to, uh, delighted to welcome Professor Shail Mayaram, uh, one of the um, major key key members of the Subaltern Studies Collective, who, who within that framework has been working on issues of nationalism, uh, of syncretism, and most recently on issues of urban spaces. Uh, welcome to the uh, discussion. And finally, I'd like to welcome Professor Gopal Guru, political theorist, who also works on key concepts such as humiliation, dignity, discrimination, and who 
occupies a public discourse, the position of the critical voice. Uh, you cannot quite ignore it, and it's very difficult to agree with it. Uh, so, so friends, uh, the theme of today's, uh, of, of today's lecture, which kind of state can, can deliver which kind of development, uh, takes you to the heart of what we hope will be a series uh, uh, hosted by the International Center for Human Development. Uh, some may say that discussions of the state uh, belong to an earlier era. Some may suggest that discussions of the state under globalization, in a sense, uh, are trying to live with, with ideas which have passed their time. Our attempt today is to examine these questions, to examine this attitude, because we sincerely believe that the time has come to challenge what we think is a new normalcy in our public discourse, a belief that there is only one way in which you can move forward, that there is only one way within which all our policy interventions uh, need to be located. We believe the time has come for a counter-discourse. We believe that it is time for us to examine this normalcy and to, and, and to perhaps establish that there is uh, an alternative way, a different way of looking at our futures. So the theme of the lecture series we have titled as the developmental state and we hope over the next uh, several months and years uh, we will be able to bring together a group of eminent scholars uh, to uh, uh, speak at different, from different vantage points uh, on the developmental state. Now, why would the International Center for Human Development do that? Let me say a little bit about the International Center for Human Development. The International Center for Human Development is a joint project of the UNDP and the government of India. It was uh, conceptualized as uh, an institutional space which would, in addition to offering policy advice, in addition to doing training for people in the policy realm in the global south, in addition to promoting research, would be an important institutional space to encourage a dialogue between the countries of the global south, to encourage a dialogue between the south, a south-south exchange, a south-south exchange that can never be more important than the times in which we live. Because the countries of the south face great challenges and confront complex paradoxes. And it is necessary for us to actually share our understanding of these paradoxes so that we would be able to actually uh, un, you know, uncover the nuances and, 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 and the shadows that lie within these paradoxes. So the International Center for Human Development is, is we hope, will emerge as an important institutional space for us to be able to engage between the different sections of the intellectual community, policy makers, uh, civil society activists, academics, government officials, so that through that exchange, we will be actually able to better understand ourselves. And with that in mind, we have actually crafted a series of activities. Uh, we've started a fellowship program, which is housed at the Indian Institute of Advanced Study in which we get fellows from the Global South. We just have the first series of fellows uh, where we have six scholars from Bhutan, from Laos, and from Cambodia. Uh, the new series has just been announced. Uh, we've done uh, uh, workshops and training programs with 10 countries in Africa and a separate workshop with 21 countries from the Asia Pacific. And we hope through this process to build this community which is so necessary for this conversation. So, uh, the lecture series is the, is, is the new initiative that we are starting. And in this new initiative, we hope to, be, to make available to the discourse community uh, the important ideas and questions that, uh, that uh, we hope all of us confront and struggle with as we try to make sense of the world in which we are located. So with these introductory remarks, I'd like to hand over to Professor Chetan Singh, who will be chairing today's discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Peter, for uh, introducing the eminent speaker 
for this evening and uh, saying something about the topic that he would be speaking on as well as the issues that this topic uh, would, uh, in, uh, would engage it and it, it engages in uh, and for introducing the discussions, the kind words that you said about me. Uh, and of course, uh, Peter has introduced the uh, International Center for Human Development that is uh, housed at the Indian Institute of Advanced Study, Shimla, and uh, many of the things that it proposes to do, particularly the, le the, the proposed lectures on the developmental state. Uh, without any further delay, I invite uh, Professor Boaventure of the Sousa Santos to deliver this lecture. So it's a great pleasure to be here. And in fact, uh, one thing that uh, uh, state and development are two highly contested concepts today. And in fact, it is different, difficult to speak of one without the other. And therefore, one should not be talking about state and development, but rather the state in development or development in state. And we have always seen that whatever policies of development that take place, they also involve the development of the very state that is in charge of development. So, uh, in this presentation, I'll be addressing um, the fact that these two concepts are highly contested today. There's a crisis of the state, there's a crisis of development. I'd like to account for that, to, to try to uh, enunciate some of the uh, the lines uh, the, and the explanations for such crises and the, at the same time, as I've always been doing, that we need to think of alternatives. And I think that we don't need alternatives. The alternatives are there. Uh, the problem is that the lenses, the intellectual lenses that we have, do not allow us to give credibility to those lenses. Uh, and I'll try to show that in the following. I think that uh, we don't need alternatives. We need an alternative thinking of alternatives. And uh, I'll try to provide some lines of that. Well, the world is changing, uh, and for very different reasons, I think that seven megatrends are likely to dominate uh, the foreign affairs of, and the lives of people in many countries in the years to come, in different ways in the south and the north. These seven megatrends are concentration of wealth, ecological disaster, hollowing out of democracy, devaluation of labor, marketization or mercantilization of knowledge, criminalization of social protest, and the end of the North-centric Western economic hegemony in the global capitalist societies. And I think that the, the list, this last mentioned uh, megatrend is probably the one that is less talked about. But it is probably already con conditioning most of the global strategic thinking in our time. Every four years, the National Intelligence Council of the CIA, is the most prestigious council, uh, study group within the CIA, the National Intelligence Council, prepares a report to be presented to the newly elected President of the United States. In 2012, the report entitled Global Megatrends, or Global Trends 2030, and it focused on the rise of Asia and emergent countries. According to this report, 
The USA and its European allies and Japan comprise today 56% of the global economy, but in 2030 they will comprise 25%. In the words of the report, and I quote, by 2030, Asia will be well on its way to returning to being the world's powerhouse just as it was before 1500. Well, I'm not concerned with the truthfulness of these predictions. We know that uh, the BRICS, as they are usual, Brazil, uh, Russia, India, China, and South Africa, they are 42% of the world population and 20% of the world GDP, and we know that they don't have a corresponding power in the international affairs and international financial system because it's still dominated by uh, European and US banks. But these emerging countries, we can see that all this uh, rhetoric about BRICS emerging is really a sad acronym for countries with such old and prestigious cultures. Um, these emerging countries are always about to collapse. Uh, they will be about not to make it, to become fully uh, immersed countries. And uh, in the last two years, probably it has not escaped you that the, the conversation by the same agency that created the concept of the BRICS is now the Fragile Five. And the Fragile Five are, of course, India and Brazil, South Africa, three of the BRICS, and Indonesia and Turkey. Notice this. Of the all emerging countries that are not fragile, is one that is not a democracy, China, and one that whose democracy is highly problematic, Russia. What does this mean? Does it mean that democratic countries become fragile for global capitalism? Maybe, I think we should talk about that. A global shift is taking place. And I think that uh, the center of global capitalism is not going to be in the norm, probably in the future, as the study I mentioned was shown. But I think that for that reason, uh, our work, uh, policy making and theory, has to really learn more and more from the global south. But as I will show, I'll try to show, uh, this is a very ambivalent recipe, the Global South, because as things stand now, very often in the Global South, and the Global South here in geopolitical terms, Australia does not count as Global South, and Haiti counts as South, it's not a geographical concept, but a geopolitical concept. As things stand now, the dominant processes in the Global South uh, seem to be reproducing the same mechanisms of economic domination and exclusion that were prevalent and are prevalent in the global north, sometimes even with more antisocial aspects. If you ask a peasant in Tet, Mozambique, a region of the uh, Mozambique where we have been working, uh, what difference does it make if the, the mining company that is displacing them is Jinda from India, or Valdo Rudos from Brazil, or any Canadian uh, or American mining company, they say it doesn't make any difference. They operate the same way, and they are related to us in the same way. But on the other hand, there is today, throughout this geopolitical global south, you can see the rise of many initiatives, uh, people that resist against this concentration of wealth, against this injustice in the world, struggles from movements, from grassroots movements, from organizations, in very difficult conditions, and probably ever more difficult conditions than before. I would say that at the beginning of 2000, there were probably better conditions than they are today, but there is a kind of an anti-imperial global south that is emerging, together with the other probably imperial uh, global south. And I'm focusing uh, on both, but particularly on the second one, and uh, I, uh, my first contact here, in fact, in India was when we met here in Mumbai in 2004 for the World uh, Social Forum. Uh, yet that time, it was very clear for us, well, we were involved in conversations in Davos, when the World Economic Forum was meeting in Davos, we are meeting in Porto Alegre, the World Social Forum, well, not anymore, and the World Economic Forum goes on uh, taking place every year. I don't know how effective they are, but the fact is that the World Social Forum is not there to have this conversation. So, I think it's very important for us to 
try to expand the conversation of the world. And all my work is based on this idea, not to demonize whatever very often very important things and theory, theories and political practices of the global north, but to uh, try to uh, eliminate one idea which is very prevalent still in global north. Uh, we, and this I speak of the uh, geopolitical global north, which is Europe and North America, basically, uh, in which, in fact, uh, they seem not to be in a position that they should be learning anything from whatever happens in the global south. When I talk to my colleagues about the excellence of social science that is produced in global south, in India, in South Africa, in Brazil, in many countries where I work, the response is always a dual response. Either we have already written about that and have done the best work about that, or it is irrelevant whatever they do. So there is a kind of a colonial prejudice uh, that is still very much prevalent and we have to do away with it. And probably I think that in this talk I'll mention some, uh, the result, not, not uh, address the, the theories, but uh, the results of these kinds of uh, countervailing theories. Well, let's, stay, uh, let's start with the state. The state, as we know, it is a modern, Eurocentric uh, institution, and um, in most regions of the world it starts as a colonial state. So, does this uh, genealogy matter? Does it matter more than the fact that the English language was for uh, many, many centuries spoken in a small corner of the world and now is the official language of so many countries? Does it matter more or less the, the fact that the human rights, even though they are Western-based and Western-created, are today considered to be universal? Well, there are two lines of thoughts about this. One is that ge genealogy does not matter. That is to say, when these ideas become prevalent, then they get in endogenized very nuclearized, they come uh, enter a kind of a vernacular uh, 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 an understanding of the different cultural patterns in which they get evolved, be they the concepts of human rights, the uh, concepts of democracy, the concepts of the state, uh, and, and you can see that then they assume extreme variation. I mean, let's, let's take as variations of the modern state the case of Iran, the case of Israel, the case of China, the case of Saudi Arabia, or in the past, the case of Soviet Union, and you can see the diversity of what we usually call the modern state. There is, however, another kind of thinking today that, is, that says that, no, this colonial state is in fact still colonial, even after the independence in many countries, is part of the colonial project, and we should uh, really replace it by something quite different, and uh, therefore, it is of no use uh, for us. I think that we see this kind of uh, thinking very much prevalent in some of the work that is coming out of the Islamic insurgency. And you see that also in the indigenous peoples' uh, struggles in Latin America, uh, about which I'll be, I'll be talking. I think I'm not saying that uh, I don't like the third ways, because the, the concept of third way was stressed by uh, European social democracy some time ago. But there is a uh, uh, another position, which is a third position, which I'm trying to develop, mm -hmm. is that it is possible, probably, to engage in the, into a deeper and more horizontal conversation of the world and try to develop some forms of co-creativity in the South and in the North and in contact and in conversation in which sometimes we start with Eurocentric concepts that have been reworked and realize and reestablish in the global south, and sometimes also take into account novelties, new concepts, new ideas that in fact could not be thought by the Eurocentric social theory, because this social theory was created in five countries at the end of the 19th century. What, what we still consider to be the founders of those social theory, they lived at the end of the 19th century, and they were uh, doing their work in five countries in Italy, in France, in Germany, in uh, uh, UK, and later on also in the United States. Therefore, their theories account for the realities of those societies at that time. We cannot blame them that they don't account for the realities of countries because at that time, the rest of the world was just colonies and they were not very well known and people didn't know much about what was going on or whatever they said was very much uh, uh, influenced by the colonial prejudices over the time. So I think that uh, we have probably, for that reason, uh, now uh, a mismatch between the theoretical thinking and the kinds of practices, innovative, transformative practices that we are witnessing 
throughout the state, throughout the world. So the modern state, there is one thing that I think I'd like to start by saying is that uh, in order to understand the concept of the modern state, we have to establish and draw an abyssal line between the metropolitan societies and the colonial societies. I think that the modern state arises and is going to develop both as metropolitan state and later as a colonial state. And in fact, it is very important to start from this abyssal line because it's a radical division of the functions of the state in these two different areas. And this radical division very often is not even visible. And that's why it is so radical, so abysmal, so abyssal, because it's so fundamental that it's invisible. And this accounts for the fact that sometimes the same institutions uh, play very different roles uh, in one setting of societies and in another setting, as I try, I'll try to show. So in the, in the metropolitan societies, the state, the modern state, is basically charged with solving, managing the tension between social regulation and social emancipation. What is this? Is that this tension between social regulation and social emancipation is the product of the two unprecedented characteristics, constitutive characteristics of Western modernity. On one hand, is the discrepancy between current experiences of the people and their social experiences expectations. That is to say, someone uh, is born poor, may end very rich. Uh, is born in a family of illiterate people, may end his life as a father of doctors. So the discrepancy between experience, current experiences and social expectations. This is new and uh, this uh, discrepancy goes together with another one which the replacement of the concept of fortuna, of fate, by the concept of risk. So we are entering with the basic ideas, the risk and this discrepancy are constitutive of the concept of progress. And as both of us a question of legitimacy and a question of governability, the discrepancy between experiences and expectations and risks involved in social sciences, they have to be politically managed. And, uh, the expectations have to be stabilized, and the discrepancy between them and current experience must be uh, calibrated and calculated in light of the political consequences. Because too wide a discrepancy, the perception of a wide discrepancy between current experience and legitimate social uh, uh, aspirations and expectations means basically social revolution. Too narrow a discrepancy between uh, uh, the experiences and uh, uh, expectations uh, means basically conservatism or reactionarism even. And somewhere in the middle there is the place for social reformism. And in fact social emancipation is always a social regulation of higher order. That is to say people get uh, 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 upset, they get uh, uh, discontent with current forms of regulation and therefore aspire to new forms and this aspiration is the impulse for social emancipation. And in fact, one of the characteristics of our time is that we have a very deep crisis of social regula regulation and no emergence of an impulse for emancipation. So it, is, it looks like that we are trapped in a double crisis of regulation and of emancipation. So but it is this idea that uh, uh, the state has in uh, in the metropolitan societies. And there are three characteristics, two characteristics very briefly. There are three pillars in social regulation of the modern societies. One is the principle of the state, the other is the principle of the market, is, and the other is the principle of the community, which in fact the liberal theory transformed very soon into the idea of a civil society. And therefore there is always a tension between these three principles. Uh, the state has been a central instrument in regulation, but it coexists with the principle of the market and the principle of the community. And in fact, we can see that the state, uh, after, so particularly in the metropolitan societies, we can see that even 
in societies in which social reformism dominated, or even in case of social revolution, as uh, uh, an eminent uh, US scholar uh, demonstrated very convincingly in the third Scotch poll, the state played always an important role. Even in the French Revolution, in the American Revolution, in the Russian Revolution, the state performed a very, a very uh, uh, important role. And in fact, I'm going to focus just on the second, uh, after the period after the Second European War, secret European in this century, of course, but uh, there were many others in the past. And uh, these three pillars coexist with three functions. So, you know, the, the state has to organize in order to develop three functions that are very important for modern regulation. The function of trust, the function of legitimacy, and the function of accumulation. Trust is the function through which the state provides some kind of insurance against threatening risks, thus reducing the social vulnerability of people uh, among the populations, be they necessary national defense, conflict resolution, social protection against risks, they, be they due to age, unemployment, accident, sickness, hunger, natural disasters. So they are the dimensions of the function of the trust. And the legitimacy function is the, the, the sets of policies that the state uses to guarantee that the social order is sustained by a mix of violence and consensus. Cannot be just violence, cannot be just consensus, but just a mix of that. And then, the function of accumulation is the function through which the state guarantees the reproduction and the expansion, expansion of capitalist accumulation. At least I'm talking about capitalist states, of course. The tensions between these three functions has been, and I'm going to show up where the things are and how our discontent today comes from, because the tensions between these three, ten, these three uh, functions have been all along present in questions of the state. But before doing that, uh, we can see that they were played out in a very different way. That's why the, the US form of state was very different from the European states after the Second European War. But before that, I'd like to mention that in the colonies, uh, Western modernity, the modern, modern state, was a very different story. There was also a bureaucracy, there were also the institutions of the state, very often with the same names, but in fact the tension in the colonies was not between regulation and emancipation, as you know. It was between appropriation and violence. Appropriation of natural and human resources and the violence that goes together with that. So the state there was uh, very much uh, uh, interested and involved in the function of accumulation. The function of trust didn't play a very important role in the colonies, and nor, of course, the, the function of legitimacy. And that's why uh, some functions, the same institutions, may be completely different when we look at them at the metropolitan societies or at the colonial societies. And we'll see later on why I'm trying to revisit this issue. Like labor laws, labor laws in the middle of the 19th century, at the end of the 19th century, they were the most progressive forms of social protection because the workers for the first time could plan their lives. They could have some security when they are sick, when they get unemployed. And in fact, this was not, in the beginning, not even uh, an initiative of the progressive uh, governments, but from Bismarck. But then it became, in fact, developed through the more progressive governments in, in Europe. Well, labor law was very, as I say, was protecting because capital and labor had very different powers, and labor law tried somehow to neutralize it. Well, in the colonies, labor laws were part of the criminal law. Labor laws uh, in the colonies was the way to regulate very often forced labor, and previously even slave labor. So <clears throat> this function shows that Seen from the perspective of the metropolitan societies, the colonial state was a permanent, as people know here very well, a permanent state of exception, and therefore, instead of reducing vulnerability, was in fact a factor of violence and a factor of uh, vulnerability. So the question does arise. Does this dichotomy between the state in metropolitan societies and state in colonial uh, societies disappear? with independence of the colonies? Can we say that this uh, 
tension between our own side, the reg regulation and emancipation on the other side, appropriation and vi violence, is a memory, a bad memory of the past? Or are they still with us? Well, I think they are still with us. I think that the regulation and emancipation, this tension, coexists today with the logic of the tension between appropriation and violence. And I submit to you that this coexistence does not exist in just only in the formal colonial societies, exists in the metropolitan societies today. And you can see, that is to say, there are in the metropolitan societies, there are some features today of the state that look like they seem to have traces of the colonial state. At least this is my uh, argument in this fact. So, in order to move on uh, on this and to show how this, uh, how this is, as I'm trying to submit to you, I have to engage the concept of development. And uh, this concept, of course, is intriguing. It's intriguing because in the literature, it's probably the idea that is probably the most contested idea in our time. And in spite of that, it goes undisturbed, uh, grounded policies, justifying policies and initiatives as if they were produced by a deus ex machina. So there's a fatality of development that goes hand in hand with the development of this fatality. So, why is that? Well, we know today that development, particularly in this high moment of the idea of development, uh, is a child of the Cold War. Began before that, but become, in fact, central after, uh, uh, during the period of Cold War. And basically what it meant was that capitalist societies offered <coughs> better options for the world uh, for development than the socialist societies that existed, existed in some parts of the world. Well, I think that, of course, there are two tales of development as there are two tales of the state. The, the tale from, uh, the tale from uh, Top down, by far the dominant uh, tale of development, is still uh, a, a tale that is based on two ideas that uh, are so evident uh, that they don't need confirmation, even though one could very well dispute them. The first one is that the development of the developed societies has nothing to do with the underdevelopment of the underdeveloped societies. That is to say, developed societies and underdeveloped societies are two unconnected uh, entities. And second idea is that developed countries have a moral obligation to help the underdeveloped countries to catch up. And this is a realistic promise, and it is translated into policies and will succeed. These two ideas are probably today very much contested, but they go around as if they didn't need any kind of, of confirmation. But there is another tale of it. And this tale, in fact, uh, is the tale from uh, bottom up. And it started, in fact, uh, with uh, the first president of India, uh, Nehru, and uh, all the friends with him that started the non-aligned movement that met for the first time in 1955, and then uh, in Bandung, and then came to 1961. Here, the idea is completely different. It's the idea that, in fact, the other development of the other developed countries is in fact the product of an unequal exchange between the developed world and the underdeveloped world in such a way that the underdeveloped countries produce the raw materials, the prices of which they don't control. The producers don't control the prices and the consumers that produce the, 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 the control the, the prices. I'm not going to dwell into the ideas of development, the concept of development. We are here at a place in which lots of people know a lot about this. I just want to focus on a tectonic uh, movement that took place uh, recently and it shook up completely the project. In my view, uh, almost brought to a collapse the concept of development and changed it forever, forever. and also changed forever the concept of the state. And again, metaphorically speaking, this, is, uh, this movement, this tectonic movement, is the fall of the Berlin Wall. I think the fall of the Berlin Wall had a, a very important impact because it is going to challenge 
two ideas that were very important for all the theories of development that we studied in the 60s, in the 70s, and in the 80s. The first one is that there is an alternative to capitalism. At that time, it was the socialist countries. And second, that is very important, there are alternatives within capitalism. The alternatives within capitalism, in fact, were the major element to give credibility to the politics of development. Because the countries could see that capitalism could take different forms and these different forms could be uh, endogenized in different ways according to the options of the different countries. So we can even say that the first and the most prominent form of alternative development and alternative capitalism is Europe after the war, the Second World War. Because this capitalism that is going to produce is a very specific one. It is a form of capitalism that combines high levels of productivity with high levels of social protection. This is unprecedented in the terms that it exists at the time. So, there was what we call welfare state, or the European social model, and this diversity of the capitalist societies was very important at the time, but collapsed in 1989, metaphorically, not exactly on that year, because I think that up until now, up until then, all the theories were about alternatives. People, the younger probably, don't even remember that. There were other theories that spoke about the diversity of the capitalist societies. For instance, the US liberal capitalism was contrasted with European uh, social democratic capitalism. Both of them were contrasted with the Japanese and South Korean corporatist capitalism. This were contrasted with state capitalism in France. This was contrasted with the mix of social market, co-management capitalism of Germany. And then there were the distinction between Fordist and non-Fordist uh, capitalist societies. <clears throat> in my view, all this changed uh, with the fall of the Berlin Wall. The highly publicized change is, of course, the idea that there is no alternative to capitalism. But at that time, it went almost unnoticed at the beginning that the second premise had collapsed already. That is to say, there is no alternative within capitalism. And from then on, we are going to have the idea that probably the only form of global capitalism must be generated on the basis of the US experience, the US liberal capitalism. And therefore, from then on, you see a crisis for different factors. And we know the factors that are behind this. Some of them, of course, predate 1989. But we are going to see the crisis of the European social model, the crisis of the welfare state. And in fact, we live today dramatically in Europe, and particularly in my country, in southern Europe, in Portugal, in Spain, and in Greece and Ireland, we see the deep crisis of this model of the welfare state. In fact, it is collapsing. And therefore, I think that from uh, there on, we are going to see the develop, this ceases to be, in fact, in real terms, a purposely and actively organized impulse for catching up. It becomes something else, it becomes kind of an automatic form that, in fact, is uh, based on ideas that were very simple-minded when we compare the literature on development. I'm not talking about the critical literature. I'm, not, I'm talking about the literature of the 60s or 70s about development. For instance, there are people here from Africa read the excellent bibliography on the right to development. Right to development with in the end was part of many constitutions in Africa. is an African uh, demand to integrate the script of human rights in our the societies. Well, today, in fact, <clears throat> the logic, the prevalent logic of development is today reduced to economic growth, no adjectives, free trade, structural adjustment, poverty reduction, and humanitarian aid. There is rebellion to this. I'll come to that in a minute. But I think that before that, I'd like to see the consequences of this tectonic movement that took place with the fall of the Berlin Wall. And I would like to say that now, in fact, uh, we are in a different situation 
that we, it is very difficult to analyze because at the time uh, we had this interesting relationship between the state in development and not state in development is that even though it was globally induced, the development was a national project. A national project for India, a national project for Egypt, a national project for Brazil. So it was there. This idea of a national project was very important in there. And the crucial element of this model was the state. And therefore, there was a name, the development of state. A very important concept that was dealt with extensively in the literature. The develop, development of state uh, was in charge of very four main policies, and they were very important, all of them, was industrialization, modernization, delinkage, delinkage, and intervention. I state intervention. I'm not going to deal in detail uh, in the debate. If you want, we can, we can analyze each one of these policies that characterize the, the development state. What I'm saying now is that this developmental state came to an end in uh, 1989. At the same time, that social democ democracy in Europe also came to an end. They come to an end as entities that, of course, will stay for many years, but in fact, uh, things change. And they change dramatically, even though people didn't notice. For instance, uh, the developmental state was based on the idea that only a strong democratic state can produce a strong democratic civil society. I can, we can, in the paper we have the access to this, there are tons of articles and books showing that in the Nordic countries, only a strong state, democratic state of course, could produce a strong civil society. So there was this equation between strong civil society and strong democratic state. All of a sudden, we changed. And from then on, only a weak state can produce a strong civil society. So the state, from being a companion of civil society, becomes the enemy. So the state, from being the solution for the problems, becomes the problem. From then on, it's going to be demonized, the predator state, as you have seen. So, and this is going to change everything. Remember the three principles of, the, of regulation, the market, the state, and the community? Well, from then on, the principle of the state gets down, shrinks, and the priority is given to the principle of the market. So we can see from then on that the functions of the state, we can see how this is going to prevail uh, or evolve gradually. The three functions of the state also change. Trust function of the state gets underfunded. It gets problematic. The legitimacy function also, as I have been showing with the, the revolts of uh, 2011, 2013. It looks like the, pr the primary and predominant function of the state is the function of accumulation. That is to say, to guarantee the conditions for capitalist capital accumulation. And the interesting factor here is the conditions are not always there. There is something more that is to be done. We can see that now with you. We don't have to travel to the global south, in which many of us created our fields. They are very much present now in Southern Europe. It's never enough. We need more flexibility in labor markets. We make them flexible. It's not enough. More flexibility. More structural adjustment. Everybody in the world knows very well this tale. This tale, of course, it's very interesting. It's the revenge of some of these uh, policies that came home to roost. Uh, and, of course, they were not problematic when they were applied in India or in Brazil or in Thailand. And now people get surprised that they are being applied in Europe. But, in fact, they are basically the same, the same actions. And here you see that people get more and more vulnerable at, two, at three different levels. Food, <coughs> finance, and ecology. These are the three major sources of vulnerability of the people, the populations when we take the world as uh, an entity. And you can see that all these crises that are concerning from the vulnerability question the question of trust. That is to say, this would be the place for the state to uh, bring about 
some reduction of the risks concerning food, concerning financial crisis, and concerning the ecological crisis. Well, we don't see that. In fact, we see sometimes that the state has become a source of vulnerability. Instead of becoming a, an insurance against risk, becomes itself, by its action, a form of vulnerability. When in 2008 we had the financial crisis in the US, and uh, as you know, I could read that very closely, I spent half of my year in the United States, one could see how important it was to bail out the banks, but not to bail out the families. And we repeat that in Europe a few years later. The same idea that the state by the policies, patients cut, salaries cut, public health underfunded, privatized, public education privatized, the end of social security, public social security, that is to say the basic pillars of the European social model. We can see that in the state, there are state policies that in fact are becoming, turning the people more and more vulnerable. That is to say, the state, by overemphasizing the function of accumulation, loses power to guarantee the function of trust and the function of legitimacy. And this is the situation in which we are now. And therefore, I think that if you take this seriously, we think that uh, what is happening at this point, in which, in fact, uh, the state, while ceasing to perform these functions, is going to create situations for revolt and rebellion. I'll come into that in a moment. We can see the revolts of indignation that are taking place throughout the world, in many parts of the world, that in a sense give us the idea that the institutions of the state in which people used to trust are not trustworthy anymore. Democracy has been captured by anti-democratic forces. The trust, the institutions are there, but they don't perform the functions they are supposed to function. And therefore, they, people take to the streets and to the plazas to voice their demands because the streets are the only public sphere that is not colonized by financial capitalists. So this is a sad story that results, in my view, from the problems of the accumulation function taking so much dominance over the other functions as if they would be taken care of by the market. Insurance, the market, of course, and legitimacy, which it's very difficult to see how the market can provide legitimacy. And you can see that in evaluating the democratic processes today, I'll come into the revolts a little bit later, but this uh, in evaluating democratic states, the think tanks that are of the business community, that is uh, you know, a euphemism for global financial capital these days, they are really very concerned about democratic studies. You, can, you may have seen the studies coming out of Goldman Sachs or others that are very much concerned with the following 2014 elections. They are very major electoral processes that involve serious political risks. They are India, Brazil, Colombia, and Turkey. No matter how different these countries are, the realities are, or the differences, context and cultural context, they, the criterion they use is always the same. The performance of the function of accumulation and the winners the favorite winners, of course, the ones that we may expect. And they are very explicit about the winners that they favor. So I think that in order to do that, we can see that this predominance of the, with the crisis of the welfare state in Europe, we can see also that the crisis of the European social model is uh, uh, experienced not just by the Europeans, but by non-Europeans. For instance, take the case of Latin America, a continent that I know a bit more. Well, there was a time in which the negotiators of economic cooperation or social cooperation between uh, the Latin American countries and the European Union was completely different from the negotiations between those countries and the USA. And they would claim that. The USA was 
very less sensitive to the needs of the people, to the cultural specificities, etc., to the social aspects, while the European Union was a bit more uh, flexible and, in fact, was sensitive. And in fact, the Mercosur, which is the, the, the common market in some countries in Southern, Southern America, is based on the idea of the European Union. Well, what do they say today? I was looking at reports from Peru and Colombia, and I chose two countries which are run by non very progressive countries, by, uh, uh, governments. Well, what they say is that the, the Latin American negotiators are at a loss. They say we cannot distinguish anymore the negotiators from the European Union from the negotiators from the US. They say precisely the same thing. And in fact, what the European Union is, is proposing to Latin America is the free trade initiative. Uh, a free trade area of Americans, which was proposed by President Clinton in 1994. Uh, uh, so I think that what I want to, uh, to, to, to give in this part of my talk, before I move to the last part, is that the bloating of the accumulation function echoes something that is very stern. Some fe features of the colonial state. Coming now in post-colonial world, and coming and occurring not only in the colonial, the previous colonial societies, but also in the modern, the, the metropolitan societies. That is to say, you can see the logic of appropriation and violence taking place under the aegis of the state in many countries. It takes very different forms, of course, in the north and in the south, but this is there. For instance, land grabbing in the global south is not just a corporate initiative, it's a corporate with the state. And the state is really involved in mega projects that is forcing the displacement of peasants, hundreds of thousands of peasants throughout the global south. I come from Mumbai. We managed to bring together for two days grassroots movements from all over India. Peasants, indigenous people, uh, Dalit communities that are resisting, organizing against the mega projects, from Assam to the Deep South. And you can see the struggle there. The state seems to be involved in the logic, from their perspective, in the logic of appropriation and violence, not the logic of regulation and emancipation. But it takes place also in the metropolitan societies. When the state is invoking all the time some emergency to cut rights and to disturb the normal constitutional uh, life of these countries. And there are two major emergencies that are usually involved, involved to destroy uh, the, laws, the normal constitutional logic and the rise of appropriation and violence. And the two of them are the financial crisis and the war on terror. They are two emergencies through which the state, in fact, involves sometimes in appropriation and violence. In the case of the, of the, the financial crisis, you can see that. We can see that in Europe now, in which, in fact, we see the European states being involved in appropriation of rights, of pensions, for instance, that are based on a contract with the state that are all of a sudden cut. It's a form of appropriation, of course, it's not a form of its unconstitutional, like you claim, and also the ways in which the Europeans are dealing with immigrants, rampant xenophobia, rampant racism. We have immigrants now in the European Union in slave-like labor. And many of them are being deported, as it happened very often to the people that resisted in the colonial state. On the other side, we see also that war on terror is leading to forms of global surveillance that are forms of appropriation and violence, because very often they are not related with terror at all, they are related to uh, commercial secrets to inventions, to patterns, as the case of Brazil illustrates very well. So it looks like that if you take this seriously, it is as if the colonial returns to the metropolitan with these disturbing features of the state that's happening everywhere. So I think that we should be uh, aware of these trends, particularly if you have uh, an, a democratic alternative and you won't really to deepen uh, our democracies and our uh, uh, countries and our states. That's why I think that from now on, I'll move on to the uh, initiatives, to the alternatives. 
I hope to be brief, but uh, I'll hope it will take me a bit more, but I'll, I'll, be, I'll try to be as brief as I can. In the sense that we see alternatives all over the world that are trying to resist this state of affairs. The state of affairs is there, and it is very serious, quite frankly. But there are resistance. There is resistance to develop a decent state, a more hospital, hospitable state, and promoting, in fact, forms of dignified collective and individual life for the people. Decency, dignity, hospitality are concepts that are very much present in the protests today. They have an ethical mark, an ethical term. And people say, well, this, this is dangerous. Well, ethics in politics always creates problems. But I think that precisely because neoliberalism is imposed on the basis that there is no alternative, many movements, many forms of resistance take the form of moral judgment, of ethics. And I don't see anything wrong with that. In fact, an, an intercultural ethical uh, move could help to restore republic rights, republican ideas republican ideas, could restore the superiority of collective action, could, respect, could restore the idea of these collective actions uh, pervading over greed and over possessive individualism. More ideas of reciprocity, of solidarity, of relationality that are, in fact, uh, not present today. So I identify in these alternatives the following, and I'll be very brief about each one of them, but it's a landscape that is quite various, quite uh, uh, diverse, and I'd like to, uh, that you have a, you know, an idea of these alternatives, where they are coming from. They are coming from the following. The first one, I developed the headings are this, the revolts of indignation, the world revolution 2011-2013, Latin American post-neoliberal social democracy, grassroots non-capitalist economies and sociabilities, and transformative constitutionalism. These are the main four ideas I see evolving that present an alternative to the state of affairs that I just described. They may be not very convincing to any one of you, but they are emergencies in my view, and we have to take them, analyze them with care. The revolts of indignation, we, that's the name, I, the general name, not just for the indignados of Southern Europe, but all the movements that start in Tunisia uh, in 2011, the Arab Spring, and then we have the Occupy movement, then you have the Indignados movement in Southern Europe, then you have the Student movement in Chile in 2012, and then you have the revolts in Brazil in 2013. There were so many at the same time that some people talked about the idea that we are in a moment of world revolts like those in the past. So, because the idea of dignity and indignation comes so, so prevalent in this movement, I call them the revolts of indignation. What are the very, very interesting characteristics of these movements in general, very generally? First one, they are, most part, for most part, peaceful. Sometimes they resort to violence, they are victims of police brutality and police violence. But they are in general peaceful. Secondly, they are volatile. You remember how it happened, how everything started in Indonesia. Self-immolation of a, a young guy that wanted to have the street vendors regulated. And all of a sudden, you have a huge movement that brought about dictator Ben Ali. In Brazil, there is a very small rise in public transportation. And all of a sudden, we are calling for a constitutional assembly for public health, for public transportation, for public education. The volatility, vol volatility of these movements is very interesting. The third one is negativity. They know what they don't want, but they don't know very well what they want. And this is very important. It's a radical negation of this state of affairs, be it the concentration of wealth or corruption, but they don't know exactly how to uh, solve it. Fourthly, they are non-institutional. They don't believe in the institutions anymore. All the social movements with which we started the, the decade of 2000 in the World Social Forum, they were institutional movements. They had leaders, they had organizations, they had newspapers, they had websites. These movements have nothing of that. They are up, there are no leaders, there are no websites very often, there are no institutions, they are non-institutional and they don't rely on institutions. That's why they take the streets for the reasons that I mentioned. And finally, 
they call for real democracy, which is quite interesting. These people are calling for real democracy. That is to say, as if the, the democracy that we have now doesn't work. So we should have a better one, an ideal democracy. Remember, the older people here will remember that this distinction between the idea of democracy and the real quality of democracy many years ago was the same discrepancy between real socialism and socialism as an ideal. Now we don't speak about socialism as an ideal, a contrast with the practice, but with the democracy. But in a sense, is the idea that this democracy has been hijacked by non-democratic forces, and therefore there is an impersonal dictatorship that is going on on the world. These movements are very clear about this. That is to say, we have our very progressive constitutions in many of our countries. We have democracy, established democracy in many countries today. But above them, there is another constitution, a global constitution of the global financial markets. And this global constitution is not democratic. It has not been promulgated in a parliament, but is in fact dominated very often contradicts what the, whatever is in the Constitution. So we have, one could say that representative democracy for these movements has been defeated by capitalism. And that's why capitalism probably now does not need dictatorship anymore. Does not need fascism. It has all of that democracy completely. It's at its service through lots of means that I have in my paper. I don't have time to go into them. The second one, very briefly, is Latin American post-neoliberal social democracy. It's an irony of history and a very interesting creativity of the South. At the time in which Europe seems to be abandoning social democracy, all of a sudden, 2002, a president in Latin America, Lula da Silva in Brazil, starts a movement based on social democracy. And in fact, President Lula even says that he laments and criticizes the European Union for abandoning social democracy at the time in which Latin American countries want to become more social democratic. It's not the same social democracy. It's a different thing, based very often on compensatory uh, measures. But it is an idea, you know, you remember the famous phrase of President Lula. My social policies are the following. I want that all Brazilians eat three times a day. Nothing else. If they eat three times a day, I'm happy. And quite frankly, I have to say that in that respect, President Lula was quite successful. I think most people today in Brazil today eat three times a day. So the idea is that these countries, you not just Brazil, before that in 1998, you had Hugo Chavez in Venezuela, and then they are going to have Bolivia and Ecuador, other countries, Argentina with, with uh, uh, Kirchner, and then also Chile with Michel Bachelet uh, anew in the power. So what, they, what is interesting to see is that these countries came to power, these governments came to power at the moment in which the natural resources went up in their international prices. Given two, two, two factors, the rise of China and development of China and the speculation with the commodities that we have financial speculation today we have with commodities. And all of a sudden, the unequal exchange of the past disappeared. So these progressive governments saw an opportunity to engage in development in the form of extractivism. It's basically very intensive extractivist type of policies in order to, be, to produce social policies. They were always considered by the right in Latin America as being against development. And now they say we are for development. We are going to exploit these resources, but we are going to distribute. The companies in Bolivia the oil companies, the mining companies, the oil, particularly the oil companies, or the natural gas, would, would keep 78 of the profits, 78% and 18% for the state. Whatever Morales did was to reverse. So 78 for the state and the 18 for the, for the companies. Everybody would think that they would leave because it would not, would not be profitable anymore. It was nationalization and so on. Well, they are there, and they make lots of profits in spite of this transformation, because the business is so profitable that even with the changes, they did that. But you know, the, the, the reason why they call themselves post-neoliberal is for two reasons. The first one is the state is a major actor in society. The macroeconomic parameters are taken by the state, controlled by the state, in fact. They are market-friendly. 
They are not interfering with global trade and so on. In fact, they are in favor of free global trade. But inside, they control the parameters, the macroeconomic parameters. And secondly, they do social redistribution. This is against the neoliberalism, these two ideas, of course. But this is not the whole story, because even if they are doing distribution, which is in fact changes uh, the, the logic of neoliberalism, at the same time, they are doing a very rude and dramatic expansion of the exploitation of natural resources. Very much like neoliberalism wants. Because now they get more profits. What happens? Land grab, destruction, contamination of waters, displacement of peasants. We have hundreds of indigenous leaders, some of which brought to power Morales, that are now in prison, accused of terrorism. What have they have done? They have blocked roads to prevent the timber companies or the oil companies to enter their territories. And today, to block a road is a terrorist act. So these are the contradictions. So, is this post-neoliberal or is it another variation of the same neoliberalism? I leave up to you because it's a, it's a long story. Uh, I'm not going, because I don't have much time, to go into detail into non-capitalist economies and sociabilities, but this is another trend that you can see, both in the global south and the global north, the rise of logics of commerce and of production that are not the capitalist logic. People, of course, that uh, try to do something different, and they come from different genealogies. The first one is the peasant economy and the indigenous economies. In many countries, you can see that these peasant economies are very resilient, much more resilient than people thought before. And today, if you go particularly Latin America, you see a vibrant indigenous economy and the vibrant markets, which have a different logic from the capitalist markets and our shopping malls. So these ideas are there, and they are together now with other forms of commerce, with cooperatives, popular or popular economic organizations that are really growing. Brazil is the only country in which they have a secretary of state for solidarity economy. Solidarity economy. There is the economy and non-capitalist economy. And it is very interesting the way they organize all this sector that today accounts for a sizable percentage of GDP in Brazil. So Brazil cannot be just measured by the economic growth but for other these measures that are evolving. And you can see that in many other countries. And you see also today, in Europe, in the United States particularly, the United States is particularly interesting uh, about this, is that the new forms of barter, uh, direct economy, uh, exchange of services and goods, moral, uh, local currencies, leaving wage policies in many cities. So things that are really countervailing forces, up until now they are very, very Emergences, I think they're just emerging, but I think they are very often, they are beacons of the future in my view. And finally, transformative constitutionalism. What is this? I, I'm inspired in this concept with a dear friend of mine, I wish you were here, and in fact I dedicate his, I forgot to mention that, but I dedicate this lecture to him, he's a Pedro Vaxi. He's a great friend of mine and he's been sick, cannot be here with us today, but uh, if he could, you would. Um, and uh, Open has developed this concept of transformative constitutionalism and we are applying it. It's a bit more critical than I myself. But what we can see is that we see phenomena today that is interesting uh, in several countries around the world is that many of these indignation movements, many of these revolts call for constitutional assembly. Why is that? Why should they decide? They are not calling for revolution. They are calling for a constitutional assembly. That is to say, a refoundation of the state and of the institutions. That's what I see more prevalent in this. And in fact, you can see everywhere, even in the Occupy movement in the United States, you see that very clearly in the Indigenados movement, very clear in Brazil, the plea for a constitutional assembly. Well, this is new because it is a kind of a constitutionalism from bottom up, from the people. Usually the constitutions, in fact, uh, the constitutions, right, if we, except for the French of the American constitutions, they were very peaceful uh, events. And in fact, uh, there are, there were, uh, it was a world of experts. In fact, I have a friend that wrote the constitutions for, I don't know, many countries in the global south. So constitutions was a kind of expert knowledge. This is different what's going on. 
are movements, social movements, that are really struggling for a new constitution. And they managed to bring about the new constitutions of this type in 2008 in Ecuador and 2009 in Bolivia. And just a few words about this, because it's very interesting for our talk. And this, uh, the first idea is that for the first time, these two constitutions don't talk about development. They use a non-colonial language to express what they want. Look at the very interesting aspect. Colonial language, be they Portuguese or Spanish or English, don't allow them to say what they want. They use the actual word called summa causa. Summa causa, you know, approximately translated into English is good living. Not living better, however better, a good living. In harmony with other human beings and with nature. And nature appears in this constitution also in a non-colonial term. It's not nature, it's Pachamama, Mother Earth, an indigenous concept, not a colonial concept, not a Western-based concept of nature. These novelties are very important because they are really, if you go to these constitutions and take them seriously, you can see what they do is they give us some ideas about the refoundation of the state, the incoming refoundation of the state. And even if they are going to fail, and most probably they will, I say that, they expand our political imagination. And I think that's what we need after the desert of neoliberalism for more than 20 years, saying that there is no alternative. It is important that these alternatives are put in paper out of the energy of the, the, these uh, social movements that manage to uh, have strength enough to, to, to be strong enough to produce these novel constitutions. What are the basic ideas of this? The first one, as I said, was the idea that they don't need the concept of development. They want to have a different way of looking at the society based on the traditions of the cultures and, of course, interacting with the global world. They are not isolationists. They are not romantic. The indigenous people are very global communities since the 16th century, so they are not closed down. But they are very much interested in the following. Again, the idea that the national state is not a nation state. The, the state has accounts for the diversity. And this diversity has to, have to be constitutionally uh, promulgated and respect. So the concepts of plurinationality and interculturality, interculturality are very important here. And because of that, they can bring concepts that are completely foreign to us. i give you just one example the rights of nature. The Constitution of Ecuador says that nature has rights. This is absolutely preposterous. I was consultant to this Constitution in 2008, and one member of the Parliament, the Constitutional Assembly, of the opposition came to me and said, Professor Boaventura, you are an European professor, well known, you have well read your books and so on, tell me, these Indians are crazy, aren't they? They want to give rights to nature? Nature are objects. Nature are inert. Only people can be subjects of human rights. And I said, yeah, my dear, you know, for the concept of nature in which we have been trained, and for me, myself also, I have been also trained in the concept of the Cartesian concept of nature, of course they are wrong. The problem is that their concept of nature is not our concept of nature. Their concept of nature is Mother Earth. Mother Earth is a living entity that lives with us. Our blood and the blood of the earth are connected in a cosmic world. And therefore, all the activities that we should have would be moved from an anthropocentric concept of human rights to a biocentric concept of human rights, to rights to these entities. Rights to nature, Article 71. It says like this, imagine this in a constitution. Nature, or Pachamama, where life exists and reproduces itself, has the right to have its existence respected in its entirety, including the maintenance and regeneration of its vital cycles, structures and functions, and evolutionary processes. But it's very interesting because rights of nature is a rhyme. This is another lesson for us that want to refund the state or are engaged in the political imagination. Because in the indigenous culture, nature has no rights. Because nature is the mother. The mother doesn't have to have rights. The rights are there. 
So what they do, they merge the Western imagination of human rights with the indigenous concept of Pachamama, of nature. And they come out with the concept rights of nature. So I think that we are bound to enter a period of transition in which we are going to have many hybridities of this thing. They start. There are hybrid concepts in, uh, in institutions, in laws, and so on and so forth. And the other thing that's very important for us is that here they go down. This is not about culture. This is about political economy. How many forms of property are protected in this constitution? Private, of course. State, collective, cooperative, and associational. Look at this diversity of property regimes. They're not just one regime. And of course, capitalist economy is allowed, absolutely. But the capitalist logic cannot run all the other economies because they are autonomous, they are different. So you have a plural political economy, and that's why here also we have also what I call demo diversity. I think we have lost demo diversity, where uh, there is uh, different conceptions of democracy. For us today, representative democracy is the only democracy that there is. But many years ago, we discussed that there were other forms of democracy. Well, on the other side of the wall, there was popular democracies. And uh, in the South, in Tanzania, in Africa, there were also non-party, one-party democracies. They were, they were not called dictatorships. They were other forms, right? Well, now we think that's just a representative democracy. Well, this constitution says something. There are three forms of democracy. Representative, participatory, and community. And they have different logics, and they have to be articulated among them. We have gone, for instance, in Brazil since some time, there is this articulation between complementarity between representative and participatory democracy. But this is go beyond. It's more demo-diversity. That is to say, our political imagination expands and, and, uh, as other conceptions of democracy come in. So, and I think that from here, from this diversity, we can see how the state can become more transparently heterogeneous. Our societies are very heterogeneous. But the state is heterogeneous in our society because of corruption, because of differential access to the institutions. It should be transparent. It should be democratic. But for that, we need participatory forms of democracy, or in the case of community democracy in, in, uh, in Latin America, it means basically all the indigenous communities for themselves. And here we know the debate, whenever we mention participatory democracy, everybody gets a little bit nervous about the return of tradition. Of course, this is a serious problem that should be addressed. But the idea is there of that. And finally, a new branch of government. The Constitution of Ecuador creates a fourth branch of governments besides the legislative, judiciary, and the executive. It's called the Transparency and Social Control branch of government. It's a way, a new branch of government through which the citizens during the period, in the middle of the elections, between elections, monitor social policies, monitor the, the performance of the different state agencies. So, what I'm, and I end, I think that uh, all these ideas, and I can't uh, go into detail, but you can debate if you want, what they show. They show the following, in my view. First, the understanding of the world by far exceeds the Western understanding. And if this is so, probably the transformation of the world may take other forms, other than those that were described by the Northern script. I think these forms of intercultural translation, hybrid forms, will be, in fact, our failures, our successes. But I think that what they are aiming at is a very simple thing that goes so unrecognized by our discourses on human rights, is that in our world today, most people, most people, I'd say, are not subjects of human rights in real terms. They are objects of discourses of human rights. And in order to change this, we need this political imagination. It may sound utopian, but I tell you, the alternative to this utopia is war. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor uh, Santos, for this fascinating.
fascinating, uh, perceptive, comprehensive, and I must say, uh, a complex presentation, uh, which uh, rich in ideas, concepts that interact with each other, and uh, very, very cleverly and critically, of course. Uh, and and, and uh, uh, the ideas that you uh, talked of, the functions of the state, of trust, legitimacy, and accumulation, and the shifts that take place in that, and the corresponding changes in the market, state, and community. Uh, and uh, of course, the uh, larger uh, question of the protests of indignation and the other alternatives globally that you have uh, talked of. So, uh, a very large sweep uh, that has been taken in this lecture, I'm sure, has uh, set a difficult agenda for our uh, uh, discussions. So, I invite Professor Sherimaira to give her comments on the paper. Good evening, friends. Uh, I'm delighted to be here at this inaugural lecture of the International uh, Center for Human Development. Uh, Professor Santos has told us actually a, uh, absolutely uh, uh, a phenomenal story, really. Uh, part of it is the old story, you know, of that we're familiar, familiar with, of the state as a form of violence, uh, the state in, in alliance uh, with the market, uh, uh, the state, as uh, I were all put it, as this kind of entrepreneurial spider in the context of, um, uh, uh, in the ways in which it makes, uh, adapts to uh, 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 problems of, of, of accumulation. And the whole crisis of legitimacy, the ways in which the street and the square, uh, as you have seen, became sites of violence, uh, sites of revolt all over the world, uh, but I think the, the more uh, uh, interesting aspect of the story that he's told us is, uh, and in a sense uh, uh, is reminded of the slogan of uh, the World Social Forum, another word is possible, and uh, which takes us actually and leads us to think about what might be the conception of the post-Westphalian state. The, uh, the post-developmental state. Um, and I see Professor Santos really as a theorist um, of deep democracy and as, as, as an activist of Swaraj. Um, and also for his work having major implications uh, for rethinking our North Atlantic-centered uh, social science. Uh, in a BN Gambudi lecture that he gave uh, for us at CSDS, he spoke about um, the epistemologies of the South, and uh, these are some of the things that have uh, that is alluded to in this lecture uh, as well. Now, one of the great transformations of our time is really the shift, uh, or this the shift in the making from representative uh, to participatory democracy. And I think the Latin American experience really uh, brings this out. Uh, in wonderful ways, the ways in which people have, uh, theorists have tried to think about now the idea of a post-liberal democracy, uh, the ways in which uh, there's been an attempt to vernacularize politics um, and also to vernacularize liberalism. Uh, I, I find very compelling uh, Professor Santos' idea of uh, uh, demo, demo diversity. Uh, and he's drawn attention to it also in a volume he's edited called Democratizing Diversity. Now, first of all, I think this has tremendous implications. The shift that we see uh, has implications for theory. And uh, it used to be thought that we have moved beyond the sovereignty question. And it seems to me that the new issue is really here about shared sovereignty uh, and divided sovereignty, uh, and about the sharing that is perhaps in the nature of, of uh, deepening federal structures, uh, deepening uh, local autonomy, uh, and uh, 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 strengthening uh, communitarian organizations, uh, and also uh, 
that uh, the, the idea that we need perhaps also now uh, given um, regional frameworks think about overlapping sovereignty. And in a sense, I'm, I'm, uh, and I'm thinking here really of Parthu Chatterjee's uh, in a statement in the politics of the governed, where he makes this contrast between pop popular sovereignty, uh, which produces the homogeneous construction of the nation, uh, whereas the activities of governmentality uh, he sees in terms of the heterogeneous uh, construction of the social. And his emphasis is on this antinomy between the homogeneous national and the heterogeneous social. And I'm thinking really that, in a sense, uh, uh, Professor Santos' formulation of the alternatives gives us an impetus really to think about the national as the heterogeneous. Uh, rather than the homogeneous. Um, and to think of, as others have put it, the state nation really rather than the nation state. Now, if we are to think about, um, and, and as Peter you know, sort of introduced the theme of, this, of um, one of the center, uh, the focus of the center will be on South South dialogue. And I'm thinking really here about uh, uh, thinking of the ways in which Latin American. Uh, politics, uh, you know, poses uh, questions for us here, here in the Indian context. And uh, this whole uh, question uh, of how we might move from uh, electoral regimes to plebiscite, uh, plebiscite free mode, this has become particularly important in the context of recent debates in India. And I'm reminded of um, a workshop that was convened by uh, one of my colleagues at CSTS um, in which a debate took place between Prashant Bhushan and Aruna Roy, where Prashant argued for uh, law through people's initiative and for actually um, um, you know, a strengthening uh, uh, law which comes from people's initiative, whereas Aruna Roy was deeply suspicious really and, uh, and pointed out the ways in which uh, various kinds of interests of, of, uh, of caste and so on um, and the powerful can subvert really forms of direct democracy. Uh, similarly, um, uh, there's been both in Latin America and in South Asia uh, an attempt really to think about uh, participatory forms of mobilization, as you mentioned, uh, the whole um, the, the attempt by the, by the Ecuadorian uh, constitution, um, which is such an important um, uh, 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 initiative in this regard. And uh, similarly, uh, there's been a recent debate here on Mohalla Sabhas. And uh, uh, of course, this is something which still remains to be seen. Uh, uh, in terms of another, uh, another recent debate has been also on civil rights and how one can go beyond you know, formal uh, uh, notions of formal equality. Um, and there's been a series of rights legislations uh, in India with respect to the uh, to information, the Forest Rights Act, and, and, and so on. Um, and in this Forest Rights Act, for instance, there was a recognition of communitarian forms of, of, of land holding. But the whole question of, uh, this is the whole question of the fact that there are, there are areas of the state apparatus which are actually, uh, you know, really immune from, from democracy and um, the ways in which also uh, uh, the ways in which also questions of vertical accountability also get subverted. Um, take for instance, uh, we have this very important legislation regarding the panchayat system, and uh, there was a whole uh, 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 constitutional amendment, the 73rd constitutional amendment. But what's happened uh, in the working of the panchayat system is that it's become a sarpanch centric imagination rather than one which, is, which strengthens autonomy. Um, uh, and uh, uh, the whole development imagination really of the panchayat system comes from centrally sponsored schemes um, which actually subvert the whole idea of, of a local initiative. And lastly, I wanted to uh, uh, you know, think about what the Bolivian constitution and the ways in which uh, it has tried to bring about the complementarity between representative democracy and communitarian institutions. 
and uh, the way in which it's recognized uh, the rights and political imaginaries of indigenous populations. Now, I've done some work on, you know, sort of peasant and pastoral communities, and um, and and clearly these were, uh, you know, these had vibrant forms of uh, what one might call democracy before democracy, um, uh, 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 you know, and. If one looks at, for instance, Ranajit Guha's work, Elementary Aspects of Peasant Insurgency, he talks about some, uh, he analyzes some hundred revolts which took place between 1783 and 1800. And these were really based on communitarian uh, uh, you know, institutions, uh, communitarian identities such as of the Santhals, the Bhils, the Kohls, the, the Gujars, and the Mewatis. Now, unfortunately, what's got reduced in terms of the way in which the communitarian is thought of today in the public imagination is a whole debate on, on carps and the need to ban carps as the site of gendered violence. And uh, so these are questions really of which, in a sense, the Latin American experience raises for us here in South Asia. But thank you for reminding us that we need to change our political imagination from bringing to the fore questions about multiple markets and the coexistence of markets, and to thinking about a non-anthropocentric ecological imagination. Uh, clearly, the script of cosmopolitan democracy needs to be re uh, rewritten by, uh, by us in the global south. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Shen uh, I now invite Professor Kupalgu to I promise I'll just take five minutes, not more than that. Uh, first of all, I must thank the organizers, both Professor D'Souza and Professor Chetan Singh for inviting me to comment on Professor Santos' very, very rich, insightful uh, presentation. I know some of it, uh, I had listened to him on earlier occasion, so I am benefited already. So, uh, uh, so I would just uh, Summarize them quickly to say that you know you are you are thrust to really produce a horizontal conversation among the social theories in this global south, which is anti-imperial. That's one qualification you're making, and I think that's what. Otherwise, global south itself is a doubtful, deceitful category with its own internal logic. So I agree with that, and therefore I think uh, one has to be careful all the time to. Uh, take uh, take this category on board, category of uh, global south. I also was very much uh, impressed by your uh, carefully analyzing the dissolution of nation state, development state into a global capitalism. And there is a very, very subtle mechanism that has gone into making this state as a part of the global capital. You have beautifully worked it out and so I have no I mean, I'm, I'm really impressed by that uh, theoretical skill you deployed to really uh, make this connection. And you are, uh, you are, you are, you are, uh, you are, your differentiation between, uh, I mean, you are, you are answer that what is the, what is the, what kind of development do you want? And, and, and I think it is a development based on non-capitalist solidarity economy, which is to be achieved and, and, and violated through uh, the plural state or the state which is heterogeneously transparent. That's a new term, I think. It's a fantastic term that we have. Otherwise, our, our state is deceitful, uh, rogue state, soft state, state with conceit, and we are not, once we elect it, and we walk out from it. So we don't know what's happening in the state. Only law experts and other experts sitting Maybe uh, in the in the farmhouses near Delhi, they only know what's happening in the state. Common people just don't know what's happening in the state, and that's why Peter finds it so difficult to agree with me. So, so, uh, so I think that reminder is well taken, Professor. Uh, I have, I thought your your last point is so fascinating about why Indians do not have, do not allow nature to have right of its own. They only have right to nature. And that anthropocentric vision of green capitalism is so dangerous. In the sense that green capitalism, which is also the dissolution of all the states of the north and some states from the south, is actually reproducing nature 
in its very 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 uh, modified form and that modified form of nature takes place through laboratories through agriculture universities and through other other laboratories as well i think that one does not have intrinsic quality to itself that the nature which is so original which has own intrinsic quality that people like ikbal would write a poem or gali would write a poem on nature because nature is unfathomable that's why it's so beautiful it has its own intrinsic value it is the wilderness that will most motivate the wilderness of uh, desert ocean mountain all that is so beautiful have its own intrinsic quality therefore let us not instrumentalize it with your anthropocentric ambition and so i think the ethics of development and the ethics of environmentalism is so important to be blended to each other and that is a important point but we are we, we have no idea whether we will stop it during destroying all those all those uh, mountains and, uh, and and hills in odisha and thanks that the people are using kaniga bridge and putting god on the cave on, on 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 the hills and making it impossible for the for the corporate to really theory from me so that's very important but two quick points for your consideration sir one is about uh, ethics the ethics uh, uh, when you are when you rely your i mean the privacy of ethics were political that's the central point i find it little problematic if you really privilege ethics were politics which i am doing these days uh, in in the context of political formation taking place the ethic is acquired in precedence of political political is it will do this i am not doing politics that is the slogan i am not doing politics i am changing politics there is ethical import it is ethical purchase on this that's a big claim now once you take this you i think they assign so much of weight to a moral action the moral action becomes so self evident and that it will itself can produce truth is that the case can you really have moral action as self evident truth without the journey through politics and therefore i think those who are actually putting so much a premium premium on premium on ethics uh, uh, they have to take this into consideration i don't think there is any uh, because all ethical is non cognitive and therefore it is not available for any kind of very very subversive political action and the action you are talking about through this working through this modern smaller assertion resistance ultimately it has to be a state, state today in india is actually the essence of state is actually uh, is shifting its base and it has become the essence the essence is becoming global not the existence of the state that is to mean that is to say that you know you are leaving all the bodies institutions of the state behind but essence is going elsewhere the capitalists are actually investing elsewhere 22000 crores and all that we have the, and you mentioned that in your uh, one of your uh, talks earlier so that essence if there is no essence within the boundaries of the state where is the possibility of movements to take shape it is only essence around which you can build up your movement theoretically if the essence is missing it's like sitting like duryodhana and under the water and you have to fish it out with the special gaze of krishna or somebody uh, we we require krishna you are one of the krishna doing in south latin america but we require someone in india and so uh, that is another problem one one has to handle and the last problem i think i have written somewhere is about uh, uh, yeah the the the, the uh, constitution i mean there is a problem the constitutional democracy and the uh, people democracy there is always a permanent tension between the two should we really put everything into the basket of people people are being the part of the republic republican movement i think uh, shail was referring to that the debate between shiv kashan bhushan and aruna roy can you really trust the people as something which is who which is sovereign to take decisions with self consciousness only in favor of the public good do you have, if that is the case what happens to patriarchy that is the case what happens to social patriarchy that is the case what happens to khap panchayat how do we deal with all this this is this is what it is and i think I'm, i'm i would have spoken more because i was talking but at the moment i must stop five minutes is correct thank you thank you so much uh, for uh, for this wonderful well comments uh, i wish we had uh, more time uh, to uh, to to uh, now uh, uh, i can give uh, professor sector maybe 3 minutes uh, completely and just time but uh, 
here we are dealing not with the progression but distribution of time. So uh, I can give you three minutes, and because we have to wind up at six thirty. So. Because then, uh, uh, well, if, if there is, uh, because we just have uh, three or four minutes, so if there's someone there to ask a question, uh, 